Thank you, Victoria, and thanks to the organisers for, uh, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, one just little observation before I get into this. I'm about to talk about observational studies, so the line of questions uh, from a few minutes ago is, is, a, is a good lead-in to what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I, one sort of curiosity just in talking to Victoria, reproducibility is a, is a topic that has not really energised the statistical community. Um, and I find it strange that there are, at least as far as I know, not that many statisticians in the audience. Hi, Giovanni. <laughs> there are a few, but, it, but I think in general it's, it's an area that, that um, you know, is not, has not been embraced fully by the statistical community, and I, I hope that happens, because uh, I think this is, this is a topic of central importance um, to, to statistics and to data science. All right, um, so I'm going to talk about some work that uh, I've been doing over the last few years um, in the context of a project called Odyssey. Um, some of you in the audience may have heard or seen some of this before, but, but uh, I guarantee you some of it uh, you haven't because it didn't exist until this morning. Um, at least the slides didn't. The work existed for a little, little while longer than that. Um, so um, I'm going to focus on uh, observational studies in healthcare very specifically. So I'm not talking about randomized trials, um, and the context is, uh, is healthcare. Um, and in particular, large-scale patient-level databases, so be they claims databases or EHR databases, and I'll be showing um, results and so on from both EHRs and uh, claims databases. So just so we're all on the same page, the kind of data that um, I'm talking about um, are longitudinal patient records, the irregular patient records. So this, this is like a cartoon version of a particular patient uh, record. So this is time on the horizontal axis, and what we have in these databases are visits, um, encounters with the healthcare system, procedures that the patient had, uh, drugs the patient took, conditions that were diagnosed in the patient, um, and uh, observations, typically things like lab values. So um, that's what these data, uh, these databases are full of objects like that. Um, that's one patient. There's another patient. There's another patient. Um, and the, the basic task here is, and you can, you know, they, they vary a lot in terms of their complexity and their in, the intensity of their interactions with the, with the healthcare system. This is a, obviously a much sicker person than the first person we looked at, and these are, these are actually real. Um, those pictures are not their, the, the real people, but the, these are actual real records. Um, so the task basically is, if I hand you 100 million of these, or actually 700 million of these is where we've gotten to at this point, I give you access to 700 million records like this. Can you do something useful? Right? Can you generate reliable, useful evidence from these observational databases? Um, and I'm, you know, to uh, cut to the chase, the answer is yes, but it's much harder than I think people think it is. Um, there are several major use cases uh, that have emerged for these kinds of, of databases. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, population level estimation. Um, so basically causal effect estimation, ca I mean, ca causal analysis at the heart of, of healthcare delivery. I'll go back. Um, so, you know, question, can we use databases like this to answer questions such as does metformin cause lactic acidosis, right? Um, or a comparative effect effectiveness type question, does metformin cause last lactic acidosis more than liburide? Right, so these are the kinds of questions that the medical journals are, are full of, are, you know, the medical journals are full of observational studies that are answering questions like that. They tend to not talk about causality, they don't use the C word, but of course that's what it's all about. That's the only thing we actually care about, right, is, is can we estimate the effect of interventions uh, using these kinds of data. So I spend a lot of my, my uh, energy on, 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 uh, on, on that topic. Uh, there, are other, there are two other major use cases that are, there's a huge amount of activity in, in, in all of these at the moment. Uh, one is patient level prediction. So can we use these databases to build patient level predictive models? Given my medical history up to this uh, given moment in time, can I predict, you know, what, uh, am, am I or am I not going to get a stroke in the next six months, um, et cetera? I might have time to talk a little bit about that. Um, and finally, clinical characterization. We can, we can use these databases in very interesting ways and increasingly novel ways um, to understand the healthcare system, to understand the natural history of diseases and to understand how patients interact with the healthcare system um, and so on. So I, I believe these are, these, uh, this is a reasonable representation of the, the major use cases for these, uh, for these data. I'm going to focus on estimation, population level estimation. So using these databases to estimate things like relative risks and hazard ratios and odds ratios and so on. Um, where it's classical statistical inference, we're trying to estimate a true unknown quantity. So how well do we do with this? Well, 
Um, there are many ways of looking at this. I'm, I'm going to sort of do it anecdotally. Um, but the, the short version is, that is not, not very well, is, is the answer to how well do we do estimation at the moment. Um, here's an, a paper that appeared in the BMJ some time ago that is typical of the kind of study that I'm beating up on. Um, so this particular one is to do with oral bisphosphonates and the risk of cancer of the esophagus, I'll, I'll just focus on here. Um, it's a, an observational study carried out in a large uh, EHR database, the, this now called the CPRD in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and they concluded in, the, in this study, the, it's an observational study that did a case control type analysis. We found a significantly increased risk of esophageal cancer in people with previous prescriptions for oral bisphosphonates. So they, they found a, 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 a problem, a statistically significant um, increased risk um, of esophageal cancer in people exposed to, to bisphosphonates. Um, round about the same time, paper appeared in JAMA. Um, different group of analysts, exact same issue, exposure to oral bisphosphonates and the risk of esophageal cancer. They concluded, among patients in the United Kingdom, GPRD, the use of oral bisphosphonates was not significantly associated with instant, or esophageal, uh, instant esophageal or gastric cancer. So two papers, top journals, exact same issue, same database, okay, arriving at opposite conclusions. So this is a little bit disturbing. So you might think, whoa, you know, I, you know, I spent a few months trying to find this one example. Um, au contraire, if you take out your laptops and start working on Google Scholar, you can find a half a dozen examples like this in 10 minutes. So the, the literature is replete with uh, examples like this. Here's just to, to make my point, uh, here's another one, oral fluoroquinolones and the risk of retinal detachment. T patients taking oral fluoroquinolones were, were at higher risk of developing retinal detachment. Same issue, oral fluoroquinolone use was not associated with increased risk of retinal detachment. Two papers in JAMA. Pyoglitazone and bladder cancer. Propensity score matched cohort study. In this study population, pyoglitazone does not appear to be significantly associated with increased risk of bladder cancer. Around about the same time, use of same issue, same database. The use of pyoglitazone is associated with an increased risk of instant bladder cancer amongst people with type 2 diabetes. I could go on. Um, I, I showed this example uh, a couple of months ago at a, at, a, at a talk I was giving, and there was somebody in the audience, and maybe there is today, there was somebody in the audience who was the author of one of these papers, I won't say who it was, um, and, and he stood up and he said, ah, yeah, but I got it right. <laughs> and it, it, in a sense, like, that's, that's the essence of the problem we currently have. There's a huge amount of hubris, right? There's a, a, a belief that somehow we know how to do these kinds of studies and to craft them in such a way that we get them right. It, it, is, it is a craft right now, and frankly, I think this is nonsense. So we have to move to a systematic scientific approach to generating reliable evidence from these databases um, instead of relying on the I got it right uh, school of thought. Um, as we all know, <clears throat> you know, the journals are full of these studies and they're in, in, appearing in, in ever increasing numbers. Um, they are picked up in the popular press all the time. So, you know, the, the, um, the, you, this kind of article, we've all, we all see these kinds of things every day of the week, right? So it's not like these are, are just, uh, are, are, have no impact on actual healthcare practice. Um, as a matter of fact, just to, to make that point, this is a picture of the use of uh, um, bisphosphonates from 2001 to 2011. And it's the percentage of people with osteoporosis who are, who are prescribed a bisphosphonate. So it has fallen from 40% down to 20% over that period of time because of a set of observational studies show, suggesting, and I, they, it may be true, I'm not, I'm not opining on it, that there are various kinds of problems with bisphosphonates, including atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw and, and, and so on. So the, the notion that, you know, that, let me phrase it the other way, these observational studies have an impact on healthcare practice unequivocally. They, as a matter of fact, in, in many ways, they are the primary source of evidence for our evidence-based, uh, supposedly evidence-based healthcare system. Um, let me show you one more example before I, I begin to talk about some of the, the, the methods work that we've been doing. Um, so here's a study that appeared in, um, in 2014 on the, the association, causal association between testosterone therapy in men, uh, which people call T, um, and myocardial infarction. Okay? So this, this study appeared, it's a very well regarded group of investigators, uh, Sandra Green and really a name familiar to at least some people in the audience, a very distinguished epidemiologist. Um, so they did an observational study on this issue. Um, and I just want to kind of zero in on one, and, and, and uh, concluded that there was an association, there was an increased risk of myocardial infarction, it doubled your risk of, of, of an MI if you were on testosterone. 
um, supplementation. And for those of you who have any familiarity with this, there's a, quite a literature on testosterone. It's a highly emotionally charged literature with major wars going on and, and, and so on. Um, but just, just to, to zero in on, the, on an aspect of the methodology here, look at this second sentence, if, if you can, maybe too small. But let me, let me read it. We compared the instant rate of MI in the 90 days following the initial prescription for testosterone with the rate in the one year prior to the initial prescription. Okay, and there, there's more to it. It's actually a, 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 um, quite an elaborate design that they did here. But the, the essence of it is first prescription for, for, for testosterone. You look at MI in the period after that first prescription as compared with the, the rate of MI in the, in the prior period. So that was what they, what they did. Concluded that there was a doubling of the risk. This was picked up in the New York Times. Uh, the FDA is all over this. There was one other observational study. Uh, FDA convened uh, um, um, an advisory committee and have actually tightened the availability of, they declined to approve one new testosterone product and in general have tightened the, uh, the labeling and so on of, of testosterone um, on the basis of these studies. There then appeared this uh, article, and there are others like it, um, this appeared in the uh, proceedings of the Mayo Clinic uh, last year, uh, the year before, 2015. Um, and this is what the authors of this study say. Any reluctance to prescribe T to men with recent MI would result in a reduced pre-prescription rate. All right? So they have a theory that it could be that a doctor is less likely to prescribe a man, less likely to prescribe a man testosterone if they have had an MI. Maybe. Right? Um, the rates of MI in the pre-prescription and post-prescription periods thus measure different things and the comparison is therefore meaningless. Okay? Now, Never mind that there isn't an ounce of evidence that what they're suggesting here is true. It may be true. I do not know whether it's true or not true. But this is, whoop, I make something up, and I conclude, therefore, that the study is, they dismiss the study in its, in its entirety. This is not science, right? This is kind of ad hoc mumbo jumbo. This is, this is not a way for us to extract evidence out of these databases, to conduct discussions on this basis. And this is exactly, this is typical. This is the kind of discussion that goes on every day of the week um, you know, around papers that are appearing, uh, appearing in the medical literature. This is exactly the, 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 the scientific rigor that we're talking about here. It's a very, very unsatisfactory situation. All right, so I'm trying to make the point that there is a crisis um, in uh, observational studies, in the way we do observational studies, the way we report observational studies, and the way we rely on observational studies. Um, so what, what are we going to do about this? Well, um, Actually, before, what are we going to do about it? Uh, let's, so I, I want to basically, um, wh wh why do we have this problem? Why is it that these studies are all over the place and we're reduced to these kind of uh, shouting matches? So there are many reasons, many different, many different choices that analysts make when they're doing these kinds of studies, beginning with the database they choose, which can, you can get different results depending on which database you use, how they prepare the data, the particular analytic choice, you know, do they use a cohort method or a self-controlled method or a case crossover method, um, et cetera. Um, analytic choices within those methods, in particular observation windows. If, if you're looking at the, at the cause and effect of a drug, is it do you just count events like MIs while the person is taking testosterone? What if they had an MI the day after they stopped taking the drug? Would you count it or not? Presumably yes. What about 30 days after they stopped taking the drug? M maybe it should be ITT, maybe you should look at all time after the person takes the drug. So that's, that's a, a significant design choice that you have to make going into one of, one of these studies. Um, all of these right now, or m many of these choices, all, almost all of them, um, are made in a, in a kind of an ad hoc, highly subjective, non-reproducible um, way. Let me drill down on one of those things that you have to do when you're designing a, a study, which is um, typically you don't usually report crude results, you report adjusted results. You attempt to adjust for potential confounders um, in the analysis. So I'm, I'm just going back to one of those studies uh, that I showed a second ago. So these authors um, provided an adjusted rate ratio, 4.5 with a 95% confidence interval, blah, blah. So why, you know, kind of epi 101, why would you adjust, right? Why report an adjusted analysis? Well. Um, in this case, they're comparing patients who took fluoroquinolones with uh, patients who took other kinds of uh, antibiotics. Um, so the, the basic problem here is when you're comparing those two groups of people, the patients who got the fluoroquinolones might well be different from the patients who got other kinds of uh, antibiotics. The problem is that those differences may be related to retinal detachment. So age is the kind of classic confounder, right? 
or the sort of um, stereotypical example of a confounder. What if fluoroquinolones are prescribed to older people right, as compared with other drugs? Um, and you know, the risk of retinal detachment does increase with age. So if the fluoroquinolone users are older, it's going to look like they're having a higher risk of retinal detachment when in fact it's because they're older, not because of the fluoroquinolones. Um, so that's why we adjust. And you know, um, reporting unadjusted analysis is, is, the FDA does it from time to time, but generally speaking is unacceptable. So we adjust for things like age, prior ophthalmic conditions, um, infections, um, etc. But the devil is in the details here. How do you decide what to adjust for? And, you know, and, and, and it can matter, as I'm, as I'm about to show you. So how we decide what to adjust for right now is based on expertise and a process of introspection. It is entirely unsatisfactory. Um, there's no ground truth. So by, by which I mean, go back to this paper here, we will actually never know whether fluoroquinolones cause retinal detachment. Nobody's going to do a randomized trial. These drugs have been on the market a long time. So that a randomized trial is simply not going to happen. The randomized trials that did take place were underpowered for this issue. Okay? So we will never actually know what the ground truth is. So this is a, this is a really scary thing. You've got um, different analysts making different choices about how to adjust and what to adjust for and so on. And there's no, there's no feedback mechanism. It's not like a, a month down the road or three years down the road, we'll find out that which of the two groups got it right. right? We'll actually never know. So this is great news if you're, if you're an epidemiologist. Right? You're never going to get found out. Um, although I'm trying to do something about that. Um, and then, of course, there's the unmeasured confounders. So smoking, for example, is rarely captured in, 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 in these, the kinds of databases I'm talking about. Um, there are also genetic factors, socioeconomic factors, lifestyle factors, and so on. And if any of those are related to making, you know, if those factors are associated with fluoroquinolone use as against other antibiotics, um, you know, we have a problem. And that's you know, why um, no matter, I, you know, I'm going to present some methods here that I think are, are, can help with this situation, but there are always limits as to how far you can go with, uh, with observational studies. So let me just show you this. So um, we, we did a, a, a large scale analysis looking at the effect of d these design choices, like which variables to adjust for and what kind of observation windows to use and so on. We did a study looking at the effects of different reasonable design choices on the output. And I want you to look at this one up here in particular. So the, 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 the drug we're, we're studying here is, is our, there are oral bisphosphonates. Um, the database is uh, it's a large claims database it's from Truven. It's the CCAE database. It has about 100 million patients in it. And what I'm showing you here is um, an analysis of the association between bisphosphonates and acute myocardial infarction. Um, for a particular method called the self-control case series, which is a, a very elegant um, and quite powerful method for, um, for causal inference. Um, what I'm showing here is the analysis, this, this is a relative risk of one in the middle, and this scale goes from about 0.2 or something like that up to about four. So what I'm showing here are different point estimates that you, you get by varying some of those design choices, right? So it's, it's varying which, which variables you adjust for, it's varying some of the observation windows. It's just varying these subjective choices. And what you see, and it's not in every case, not as bad in every case. I'm deliberately picking a, an extreme one. Um, you, know, you can go from statistically significant. The green ones are, are statistically significant in the positive direction. So this is a relative risk north of four and statistically significant to a relative risk of you know, uh, point, point 0.4 that's statistically significant in the other direction depending on the choices that you make. So, the, you know, you would like this, this, this not to be the case. You would like it to be the case that your results are not sensitive to the, the, the intricacies of these little design choices, subjective design choices, um, but it ain't so. So, I could go on and on. There, I, we, we, the, the group that I was involved, the project, there was a project called OMOP that um, I was involved with for about five years. Um, we did an extensive analysis of all of the design choices that go into these kinds of studies. Um, and, and demonstrated that you know, across the board there is sensitivity to these subjective uh, uh, design choices. This is not easy, right? And we've known this is not easy for a very long time. Cause and inference is really hard, and that's what we're trying to do here. So it, it, it really shouldn't come as a surprise that it is not as simple as saying, ah, I'll do a case control study, Poof, we'll adjust for age and sex, we're good to go. Right? It, it's, it's rather more complicated than that. Um, Okay, so uh, let me move on to some thoughts about uh, kind of what we might do about it. 
we've got to move away from the arts and crafts to something systematic, is my, my basic point. Um, so, first of all, here's just a, a snapshot of, uh, of the, the, the world of observational studies. So, in this uh, particular analysis, we took, um, I think it was a six-month period in 2016, and extracted all observational studies out of the medical literature, right, from a list of about 1,000 thousand, uh, thousand medical journals. Um, <clears throat> and what you can see is, I'm going to show a bunch of plots that look like this. On the horizontal axis is the effect size, the point estimate that's in the paper, right, the published paper. On the vertical axis is the standard error. These red lines here are the boundaries of statistical significance. Okay, so I'm, so I'm going to show a few of these. So, so try and get, get your head around what I'm, the kind of picture I'm showing here. So you, you get to be statistically significant if you're out here or out here. In, this is the positive, you know, north of one, south of one. And up here is where it's not statistically significant. So you get to be, stati um, you get to be statistically significant um, if you have a large point estimate and a small standard error. Okay? And it can be, you know, if, if in here you can have quite a small um, effect size, but if the standard error is sufficiently so small, it can still be statistically significant. Okay? So, and these boundaries are linear in that space. Right, as, it, um, as it happens. So ponder that picture for a second. This is the, the literature. Right? This is the observational literature. So um, well, first of all, 85% of exposure outcome pairs have P less than 0.05. Right? So there's your publication bias right there. Right? So we do not presumably believe that 85% of the effects that were tested are actually true. Um, you can see this you know, bizarre clustering just below statistical significance, just, you know, just under that line. This is from about 30,000 30, estimates from 12,000 papers um, in, in, in the literature. So um, this is rather disturbing. Uh, why, you know, why does this happen? Well, it's all the things I've just been talking about, one assumes. So it's observational study bias. It's, it's innate bias that, there's no, that you can't do anything about. It's things like measurement errors. So, I didn't touch that. Um, it's publication bias, one assumes, it's p-hacking, et cetera, et cetera. That's why the published literature um, looks as disturbing as it, um, as it does. Um, reproducibility of observational studies um, is essentially never possible. So I would, you know, if you take any study, take, take um, so flip back here for a second, take that paper, right? I guarantee you, you cannot reproduce this study. Right? You will find there just isn't enough information. Let, even if you could get access to the data, there just isn't enough information in here, and the, the code is certainly not available. There isn't enough information in here for you to reproduce it. And it's, it gets down to kind of very mundane things. They might say in the paper, we adjusted for age. Okay, well, what does that mean? You put it in as a linear effect, you broke it into categories. What did you do about missing age? What did you do about, inv about invalid ages? And, and so on and so on. So there's never enough information to, to, um, to reproduce these to reproduce these studies. Now, um, that said, and this is actually an important point, um, I showed you pairs of studies where they arrived at opposite results. Even if we could reproduce them, we have a problem, right? Because they can't both be right. So reproducibility is a significant problem in observational studies, as it is in randomized trials and, and, and other kinds of studies. But it is, it is only one problem, one of many different, uh, many different problems. I guess I need to move along here. Um, so we need a new approach. We need an approach that is reproducible, an approach that is systematized, that gets the human out of the loop in, in designing these studies. Um, crucially, I think I, I, I would argue, we have to embrace the concept of negative controls and positive controls. And I'm, I'm going to show you uh, how we're doing that. So negative controls in the context of drugs, negative controls are drugs and outcomes that are known to have no causal association, okay? Now, how would we know that? And there's kind of a circularity to this uh, issue, because if we knew that, well, then why are we doing these studies in the first place? But um, I think we can make a reasonable attempt to identify negative controls. Um, my, the group, my group is doing this by doing extensive literature crawls, looking for any evidence of an association and, and, and not finding it, if, if, if it's to be a negative control. And we do an analysis of the product labels, worldwide product labels, right? Structured product labels, the package inserts um, in, in the drugs. So we built tools to do systematic analysis of product labels. So there can be no mention of the outcome in the label for that drug if it is to qualify as a negative control. And finally, we do analysis of spontaneous report databases. So the FDA maintains a very large spontaneous report uh, adverse event database. 
we do automated analysis of that database, and again, there needs to be no association in order for something to qualify as a negative control. So I'm going to show you how we use negative controls. Um, um, we also are, uh, have, have developed algorithms for, for injecting positive controls into the databases. So negative controls, drugs and outcomes with no association. Positive controls are drugs and outcomes with a known association, a, a relative risk of two or three or four or, or, or whatever it is. They, do, they are hard to find in nature. Um, and it's, it kind of gets a bit philosophical. I think we will never know, we'll never identify a, pro, a natural positive control because we will never know what the true relative risk is in any situation. Um, but we, what we can do using model-based methods um, is inject signals on top of negative controls to achieve a desired true relative risk. Um, and, and with that, we can then compute calibrated confidence intervals. I'm going to show you calibrated or empirical p-values, and we can also compute calibrated uh, confidence intervals. All right. Um, quickly, uh, how do we use negative controls? And I'll skip over the, the technicalities of the positive controls. Okay, thank you. Um, negative controls, how do, how do we use them? So let me, let me walk you through an, an example of uh, how we use negative controls. So here's a published study um, in, in a journal in 2008, clopidogrel and GI bleeding. The um, estimated, it's a, it's a rate ratio here is two. There's the 95% confidence interval. The p-value here is about 10 to the minus six. So it's, it's a very small p-value, okay? So this is a very routine kind of observational study. So um, where does that p-value come from? Well, there is a, a theoretical null distribution that you, you can get from your textbook, right? Gaussian centered on one. And we look at, you know, if, the, if there was a drug there, the p-value would be that, grit, that brown area. And you can double it or not double it. Um, in this case, clopidogrel is out here, and that's why the p-value is 10 to the minus 6. All right? Now, that null distribution assumes no selection bias, no measurement error, no unmeasured confounders, um, and on and on. Right? It assumes away all the problems that we know exist. Right? So it's, it's, it's hubris right? to, to, to proceed as if this represented the, the true null distribution. We know it doesn't. Now, however, for, uh, pardon, for GI bleeding, we have identified a set of, I think it's about 60 drugs that we believe are negative controls. We have about 60 drugs for which there's no evidence on the face of the earth that the drugs are associated with GI bleeding. So we think that the relative risk, the true relative risk for those drugs is one. So therefore, if we apply that exact method, that it's a, it's a, it's a case control method, it mimics what was in the paper, um, on this database, for those negative controls, right, those drugs for which the, the true relative risk is one, they should all be in here. 95% right? of them should be you know, between there and there. Okay? So I'm, 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 I have to make the scale a bit wider because you might predict what's going to happen here. So that's where they actually are. Okay? So they are, you know, th these are meant to be draws from that null distribution. What the, that p-value and the confidence interval that you see in the paper assume that those blue dots will, are all you know, clustered or in the gray area in the middle. Right? And as you can see, it, it, you know, it ain't so. So in fact, 55% of these negative controls have a p-value less than, uh, less than uh, 0.05. So the false positive rate in this particular context is 55% when it's meant to be 5%. Right? Now, they're not all as bad as this. Some are worse. Right? We have examples where it's worse than this. Uh, but we also have examples, and I, I will, if, if I speed up, I'll show you one, uh, where it's not quite as bad as this. But, but nonetheless, you know, that's the kind of false positive rate that we're, we're uh, facing in these observational studies. So they're junk, right? The, P, the published p-value doesn't mean anything. So it's a meaningless number when they talk about 10 to the minus 6. So there's an obvious thing to do here, which is to fit an empirical null distribution. Right? Forget the theoretical null. We know what draws from the null distribution look like. So fit, you can do a density estimate or fit a Gaussian or whatever. Uh, fit a distribution to that and compute an empirical null uh, I beg your pardon, empirical p-value. And in this particular case, the it's not on the slide, I guess. Um, the empirical p-value here is about 0.3. So you think it's 10 to the minus 6, right? You think you've got solid evidence that you can take to the bank that clopidogrel causes GI bleeding. In fact, what you have is some evidence, but rather weak evidence, uh, with a p-value of 0.3 that clopidogrel causes, uh, causes GI bleeding. So that's how we're using... Uh, uh, negative controls right, to generate calibrated or empirical uh, p-values. This is a, not a, a new idea. This has been around for a while I mean, in different contexts, although not in, not in this context. 
I'm going to skip this because I, I talked through that already. Um, let me describe um, this picture, and, uh, and then I'll show you the results of, of a larger scale study. So um, here's one way of displaying the, the information that's, that derives from negative controls about calibration. So this is the same picture, as, this is in the context of a comparison of two um, drugs for depression. Um, this is the picture I showed you before. These are, are effect, S, effect sizes on the horizontal axis, standard errors on the vertical axis. The dashed lines are the, the, the uh, conventional 0.05 uh, boundaries. Um, and so you can draw on, to, on these pictures using the empirical null distribution, you can see what the calibrated boundary is, right? And it's not the same as the, as the, the, the nominal boundary. So, um, in, in, so up here, on this side, it's, they're, they're more or less on top of each other. But the action in this case is in here, right? So the, th this is the nominal boundary. This is the calibrated boundary. So in this particular case, calibration doesn't have a very dramatic effect. Um, but, and this is the, the, the kind of key point, um, in this particular case, 4% of the, these are negative controls, 4% of the negative controls have a p-value less than 0.05. So the calibration, you, the, the nominal error rate is as high as 55%. Um, in this particular case, I think it's 16%. Um, after calibration, you achieve the nominal rate. So if you use the calibrated p-value, it behaves as it should behave, which is to say, it won't necessarily get it right, but the error rate, the type 1 error rate, will be approximately 5%, um, give or take. All right, uh, we've recently conducted a, um, um, and, and just submitted this, um, a large scale study or, or a kind of an um, example of a strategy for conducting observational studies that we think has some, has some promise. We, we looked at depression, depression is very common. We looked at 15 antidepressant drugs and two procedures, so 17 interventions for depression. Um, we chose, um, and then we, we're doing, this is a comparative effectiveness study, so we're doing head-to-head -head comparisons of all 17 of the, the treatments. Right, so 17 choose two, actually 17 times 16 because it's, we, we look at it both ways. Right? Um, so 272 studies, if you will, for 22 different outcomes. So that's 17,718 studies. The, the, we couldn't do some of them because there aren't enough data. There isn't enough power for, to make it meaningful to do some of the comparisons. Um, but in essence, what we're doing here is approximately 18,000 studies, each one of which would be is the kind of study you would see published um, in, in the literature. And I think one of the keys here is, to, is we need to stop thinking about doing one-off studies to thinking about doing very large numbers of studies. Do all studies, not just one study. Um, we have, in this case, 52. We've developed 52 negative controls that are not caused by any of the exposures. Um, these are the outcomes that we're looking at. They're basically meant to be typical outcomes that are considered um, as possible effects of antidepressant uh, drugs. And um, I, can, I can put that back up later if, if you want to look at it. Okay, so here's, here are kind of some of the, 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 the findings. So it's the same kind of picture I was showing you before. On the top row um, are, th this is for the negative controls where the true hazard ratio is one. These are for positive controls, where the true hazard ratio is 1.5, 2, and 4. Um, across the top here are the results pr prior to calibration, right? prior to calibrating the confidence intervals and, and, and the p-values. Um, the, the, the method that we're using here is it's a new user cohort design with high-dimensional propensity scoring. Um, and there's um, um, a, a detailed, this is, this is completely reproducible. You can take the code that's on the website associated with this paper, run it against the exact same database, and you will reproduce these pictures uh, precisely. So it's an automated new user cohort designed with propensity matching with built-in diagnostics to do with the, the propensity scores that I, uh, I'd be happy to talk about. Okay, so what we find here, there are 40,000 uh, studies in here of the negative controls pre-calibration. So 86% of the confidence intervals contain one. That should be 95%, okay? That's not catastrophic. It's not as bad as the, the, the example I showed you a second ago, but still, you know, that 95% that confidence interval ought to contain the truth 95% of the time. It's, you know, and it, it doesn't. It's more like 86% of the time for the negative controls. Um, as the true hazard ratio goes up, up here, for instance, when the true hazard ratio is four, the, the standard confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, contains the truth 73% of the time, okay? So you think it contains the truth 95% of the time, and 
And the bizarre thing is like how we fuss endlessly over the minor little details of the, of the analytic method and so on. Whereas, you know, in fact, it's not, you know, what should be 95% is 73%. It's just grossly off. So fussing over little details in the algorithm seems uh, kind of um, absurd in the face of this kind of deviation from, from nominal. What I'm showing on the bottom row are the calibrated confidence intervals. And I didn't describe the procedure for calibrating the confidence intervals, but it's related to the, what I showed you for the negative controls. Um, and what we see is for the, for the negative controls, the coverage is 95%, 94.3% when it's 1.5, 94%, 94%. So you can, by, achieve, by using negative controls and injected positive controls, basically you can achieve statistical, produce statistical artifacts that actually mean what they purport to mean. Um, so that's, that's against the controls. And then what I'm showing here is that's the picture I showed you earlier. It's, a, it's a, um, a slightly larger version of what I showed you earlier. This is a snapshot of the literature. These are all observational studies. Um, only 19% of the confidence intervals in the literature contain one for all the reasons we, we talked about. This is the observational literature on depression treatments, the, the depression treatments that we're studying um, in, in this study. Um, just 29% just of the confidence intervals include one, and you can see it just visually. Right? The, li the literature is here, right? There, and it's clustered just under the line. Uh, there's the, you know, the p-hacking that we're, that we're familiar with. So this is the, the results for the 17,718 actual studies we're doing here. So it's not, not the negative controls or the positive controls, but the actual questions of scientific interest. 87% um, of the confidence intervals include one. So that, that should not be 95%, because we believe that surely some of these drugs do cause some of these, uh, some of these outcomes. Um, and you know, I would suggest that the stuff that's down here that is statistically significant using this, this calibrated method certainly warrants further investigation. And if, if there was a particular issue that I wanted to study, do, does sertraline cause GI bleeding, um, I would want to look at it in the context of all of the studies of all, dr all drugs for depression um, and all outcomes. Okay, um, there's an app um, which, if you're quick, you could write that down, uh, which allows you to play with these visualizations. That's a whole lot of fun. You can drill down on different drugs and different outcomes um, and the I can certainly give it to people later if, uh, if, if I'm being too quick here. Um, okay, so let me wrap up. Um, so the, our, I, 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 I will explain in, in the, at the very end what Odyssey is. Um, so the Odyssey recommendations for evidence generation are first of all, post the protocol online. So everything should be pre-specified. That was discussed in the questions uh, at the end of the previous talk. Um, there's very interesting work going on in the social sciences with pre-registration of observational studies. There's a very significant effort underway that I think we could mimic um, and, and uh, use some of their tools. It is critical that the study code be open source. Everything from CDM there refers to common data model, the software that prepares the data. So in this particular context, we're using the OMOP common data model. So the software to convert your data, the Truven data, the GPRD, whatever it is, and to this common data format needs to be open. Um, and it is, and it's reproducible, um, up to the code that actually computes the hazard ratios. There's no reason in the world why this can't all, it should all be open source. It should be validated, right? Um, I was just having this conversation with somebody at the, with uh, Jingjing at the, at the break. Um, you know, custom built software for one off analysis is a really scary thing, right? It's what we do, we write code to do our you know, logistic regression or whatever it is and plug in our, our covariates and what have you, the, the, the propensity for error is, is very scary. So we shouldn't be doing that. We should be using standardized, validated tools to do any kind of analysis uh, like this. Um, and I think there's real value in replicating uh, results across several databases. Um, th that said, it's not a panacea. And in earlier work, we published a paper showing um, you know, just because you've replication does not mean you've got it right. And in particular, the same, basically the same confounders and, 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 and threats to the validity obviously can be at play across multiple studies. So it isn't, isn't a panacea. Um, I think there's real value in doing the kind of large scale estimation that I just described. I mean, each estimate, each of those 18,000 studies that were on that picture, you know, is, is, is produced with, I would argue, the same rigor as uh, actually better rigor than any published paper um, and could, you know, could be published as a paper. Um, um, you should consider multiple testing if you're going to use multiple outcomes. That's not what I have in mind here. Just because I've got 18,000 studies on the, uh, you know, on the picture 
there isn't a multiple testing problem per se, because the idea is to look at your one study in the context of those, uh, those 18,000 studies. Um, let me skip this, I've basically said all that. Uh, let, let me end by just saying a, 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 a remark or two about Odyssey. So Odyssey is uh, the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics Collaboration. It started about two and a half or three years ago. Um, this is a worldwide collaboration um, involving about 80 researchers who are focused on, on the various use cases that I described at the beginning for large-scale observational healthcare data. Many of the uh, participants in Odyssey, it's completely open, anyone can join this. Um, many of the participants in Odyssey own data. Right? They sit on observational databases. Um, these databases, the, 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 the collaborators, have mapped their data to the OMOP common data model, which is a particular common data model that has, has um, become widely used. Um, so these databases are not centralized. They are distributed all over the world, but the union of the databases has about 700 million patients. So it is possible with the collaboration of the folks in this, in this network to conduct analysis. You can write a piece of code, test it and validate it on one database, distribute it to the network and conceivably run an analysis with 700 million patients. That's a non-trivial fraction of the world's population. So, um, you know, sample size is not, is, sample size is not the problem, in, you know, in, in meaning, okay, we, I guess we could have 10 times as much data as that someday, but we're never gonna have 100 times as much data as we, as we have now. Um, sample size is still a problem, of course, when you're looking at, at rare drugs and or rare outcomes, you still run out of data, even, even with 700 million patients. Um, the, um, we, can, we published one study last year, actually I presented it here two years ago, before it was published, um, where we did a, 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 essentially a healthcare, it's a, it's a characterization study, looking at a line, drug, pharmaceutical lines of treatment for different, uh, for different uh, um, conditions. So in this case it's diabetes and what you see here is the inner circle is the first drug of choice used in the world for diabetes. It's metformin. So 75% of patients start on metformin. The next one is the second drug they use after they use metformin, then the third drug um, and so on. So this is not rocket science. This is descriptive statistics. But there are about, in this particular analysis, there are 250 million patients included in this analysis. So you really can characterize how diabetes is treated around the world um, using a, a resource on this scale. Um, and you can slice and dice it in very interesting ways. I won't, uh, I won't get into it. That's hypertension and, and so on. Um, so I would conclude by saying, I think an international community and a global data network, um, which I've just been describing, um, can be used to generate real-world evidence in a secure, reliable, and reproducible manner, and efficient manner. Um, a common data model is critical, is, is kind of critical, is a critical component of everything I've just been describing, right? If you have to write code, separate code for every single database, it's, it's a lost cause if you want to do stuff on this kind of scale. So common data models, be it the OMOP model or the uh, Cornet model or whatever, there are several common data model, uh, models out there, is vital so that you can, you know, the, the data, no matter where they are, are in the same format. One piece of code can run anywhere in the world um, and, and, and generate evidence is, is critically important. I think we have a long way to go in terms of generating, in terms of population level estimation, we have a long way to go in terms of having truly systematic, reproducible, reliable methods. Um, I'd like to think that some of the things I've been talking about are steps in that direction. I think the, the current state of affairs is totally unsatisfactory, and I, I really hope that we can move to a, a, a better place. Thank you.